everybody. This is Dr. Alex Avila with Love University, and we're back. I'm an author, psychologist, and speaker. Every week we talk about how to love ourselves, others, and higher power, how to improve your finances, relationships, emotional health, spirituality, and physical health. And today we're very privileged to have a very esteemed guest, Donald Hoffman. Donald Hoffman is a UCI professor emeritus. He's a cognitive scientist, uh, has a PhD in computational psychology from MIT. He's won scientific awards, including the American Psychological Association Distinguished Psychology Award. His TED Talk, Do We See Reality As It Is, garnered 3.5 million views. He spent over 30 years studying visual perception, artificial intelligence, evolutionary game theory, and the brain. His writing has appeared on Scientific American. He's been featured in Atlantic, Wired, Quanta. He's the author of The Case Against Reality, Why Evolution Hid the Truth from Our Eyes. Welcome, Donald, to the show again. Thank you very much, Dr. Abel. It's good to be here. Yeah, we had you back a couple years ago, and you know, your show has been one of the toppest rated programs on Love University. Oh, and, wonderful. And, I'm, I'm honored. Yeah, yeah, people love it. And I even asked my producer, Reggie, Reggie, uh, this is a very scientific, um, people might say even nerdy topic. How do people like it? He said, well, there are a lot of nerds in the world right now, a lot of uh, intellectual people. So <laughs> <laughs> I guess they, they love this topic. So talking about this, you, know, you have a very fascinating theory. Uh, you talk about the idea that when we see the physical world, it's not really objective reality. It's some kind of subjective perception or, uh, that's different from people to people. So when I look at the moon, my moon is different from your moon. And you say that things like space, time, and objects aren't necessarily uh, real in the sense that we think that they're real. So tell us a little bit about that, uh, this uh, idea. And I know you talk about conscious realism, consciousness, and conscious agents. So tell us a little bit about how that works. Right. So most of us think that when we look at the world around us, our senses are telling us the truth. Right. Um, I see the moon, and you look up and you see the moon, and we're both seeing exactly the same object, and yes. the moon would exist even if no one were there to perceive it. In fact, presumably the moon was there for billions of years before there were any uh, human beings on the planet. Yes. And, and so, and to the extent that we want to try to explain why we believe that, well, for, first, you know, we're just born sort of believing that, right? Yes. Um, Piaget, the, the child mm. psychologist, right. um, pointed out that we, as very young infants, you know, he thought 18 months of age, yes. we get what he calls object permanence, the, the yes. deeply wired in belief that the objects that we see mm. continue to exist even when we don't see them. Right. And he, he argued that, you know, you take a, a doll and put it in front of a <laughs> pillow, uh, the child will play with it and put it yes. behind the pillow. Right. Before 18 months, they won't go and look for the doll behind the pillow. But after 18 months, they right. go look for it because they've got object permanence. And yes. so later work showed uh, that we probably get that by age four months yes. uh, of age. So the reason we believe that our senses show us objects that really exist it is not because we've been persuaded about that biological argument. It's because we were wired to believe that when we were four months old yes. and we were in no position to argue. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is just the way we've seen the world since before we could reason. And so that's why we believe it. So so now let's actually look at the arguments, right? Yes. So, well, the kind of argument we give is, well, I look at the moon and say, um, yeah, I see the moon. Do you? And you say, yeah. Right. I say, well, I'll look away. Can you still see the moon? You go, yeah. Oh, well, the moon must be really there when mm. no one's looking. Mm. So, but that argument actually doesn't hold any, any weight at all. Yes. Um, so I decided to, to – I'll just give you an example why it doesn't hold any weight. So play, suppose you're playing a virtual reality game. Right. And say you're driving cars in the VR game, the Grand Theft Auto. And I look over and I see um, a red Ferrari. Yeah. And, you know, because I, I have a headset on, I'm, mm -hmm. so I'm thinking of VR version of this game. I yes. look over and I see a red Ferrari. I look away, I, I no longer see the red Ferrari, but I can say to my, you know, my, my friend in, you know, in um, China, who's yes. who's playing the game with me, I said, right. you know, can you see the red Ferrari? And he says, oh, yeah, I can see the red Ferrari. I go, well, I'm not looking at it. So that shows that the red Ferrari really exists even when I don't look at it. Mm -hmm. Well, well, no, I'm creating a red Ferrari when I look over there because yes. I'm getting pixels on my headset. Yes. And my friend in China don't, is creating their own red Ferrari because they got pixels in their headset right. that are spraying to their eyes. And so, right. so any kind of argument that you give where, I, you know, if I take uh, a, a tennis ball and I drop it and look away, I know where, I, where I, it will be when I, if I look back again, again in a virtual reality kind of context. Yes. Well, again, 
the fact that you know you know where it's going to be doesn't mean that the, the tennis ball is real. I'm creating the tennis ball in the virtual reality when I look at it, yes. and I'm I'm no longer rendering it when I don't. So if you if you think about it, every argument that you would give to say that physical objects really exist even when I don't perceive them, yes. if you take it in a VR context, you realize that none of those arguments go through. I see. But, but now but, let me ask you this question. So you know, psychology, consciousness, we see of it as awareness. And there's a famous phrase, I think, therefore I am. So being aware of yourself is what makes you, I guess, who you are. Uh, so that's fine for me, you know, because you use terms like consciousness and conscious agents and also conscious realism. So I assume conscious realism, is that the theory you're talking about, that there is no objective reality? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, so conscious realism is the theory that there is an objective reality, but it's not space and time and physical objects. Ah. So that there is an objective reality, and it is of consciousness. Yes. So that there are, by, by consciousness, I, I just mean simple things like the experience of the taste of chocolate, mm -hmm. or a headache, mm -hmm. or the smell of garlic, or something like right. that, or you know, the feeling of an itch, yes. or an emotion of, you know, of anger or, or, or love. Those are, um, those are all simple conscious experiences. You can right. also talk about more elaborate self-awareness states and so right. forth, so consciousness introspecting on itself. Yes. But, but the kinds of issues that I'm raising about consciousness hold for very simple conscious experiences that I could imagine even a mouse might have. You know, presumably a mouse smells cheese and yes. might uh, enjoy eating cheese, I mean, right. for all I know. Uh -huh. And so, so that's what I mean by, by consciousness. And, and of course, that's it. intuitively, when I work on what I call conscious realism, now I'm dealing with a mathematical model, uh -huh. right? So I, I use precise mathematics now to describe um, um, structures of conscious experiences and how they inform or guide um, choices and how, mm -hmm. how that can then affect the network of conscious experiencers and their choices, or what I call conscious agents. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the mathematical model that I and my, my team are working on is like a vast social network, like like the right. Twitterverse. Yes. Um, you know, with it, in the Twitterverse, if you think about it, there are um, there's tens of millions of users, Twitter users, right. and they tweet. So you're you're broadcasting your ideas. They're influencing those who follow you, yeah. right? They're getting so you're you're altering the experiences of your followers. Mm -hmm. They get new experiences based on what you tweet out. Right. They think about it, and then they choose to you know like to like it or to comment right. or to retweet it or to or tweet something on their own in response right. and so that's that's sort of like a top level what I'm, what I'm talking about when I talk about this new theory of conscious agents that, yes. that it's, it's, it's a vast social network um, and it's the dynamics of the social network which is the fundamental reality I see. and where does space and time come in hmm. well the Twitterverse, with tens of millions of users, billions of tweets, and lots of stuff trending, there's no way that you could ever read all the tweets or interact with all the Twitter users, right? right there's no way. It's, it's right. overwhelming. Yes. So if you want to get a feeling of what's going on yes. when you have vast social data like that, what do you do? Well, what we do is we use visualization tools. Right. We might create a virtual reality tool that you can put on a headset and bodysuit right. and and instead of looking at tens of millions of tweets and, and you know, or billions of tweets, you get some kind of visual simplification. Here's mm -hmm. what's trending in New York City. Right. And you have some simple graphic that you can see. Yes. And here's what's happening in, in the country of China. Exactly. And here's what's happening on your street, you know, in, in your city. And so you can right. zoom in or zoom out. Right. And that, I claim, is what space, time, and physical objects are. So, mm -hmm. so the, the big picture is, we, we tend to think of space and time and physical objects like the moon as right. the fundamental reality. Right. I'm saying let's change our perspective around. Right. The real reality is this vast social network of conscious agents. Yes. And what we call space and time and physical objects is a dumbed-down hmm. visualization tool. Right. Simplified. I think you call it like a desktop, an icon, or an interface. Where, That's that, right. Think about that with that metaphor as well. So, right? so if you're working with your yes. computer, you could have a desktop interface as right. well. Right. So that's not really a computer because a computer is made up of nuts and bolts and other stuff you don't know about. But you have a that, simplified uh, representation, which makes it easier to to work with. Now, the other thing you talk about, Donald, is the idea of fitness payoffs. You say right. for natural selection and evolution, 
there are certain things that we do that can help pass along our genes to the to new generations, you know, so we kind of reproduce. Uh, for example, if you eat a healthy apple, you're more likely to survive and, and live longer as opposed to eating a poisonous apple. But I was thinking about this, but isn't it true that humans actually do opposite many times? They, they choose the short-term pleasure of junk food, uh, maybe drugs, uh, maybe abusive relationships. So they actually bypass that whole idea of long-term evolutionary uh, advantage, you know, for short-term uh, pleasure. And we had a guy on the show, um, Neil Donald Walsh, you may have heard of him, uh, Conversations with God. And he's talking about that everything really is love, even though it may be misguided love. So if you love this car over here and you want to get it, you might steal it, even though long-term you're going to go to jail and uh, suffer consequences. So why do people do that? I mean, they go against their evolutionary uh, payoff, in a sense, when they do those short-term thrills. Right. So so I'll answer that in the context of evolutionary theory. So what do evolutionary uh, psychologists themselves actually yes. say about that? And, right. and, and the idea within that framework is that um, evolution – doesn't shape us to be consistent. Ah. Okay, evolution shapes us with all these little modules for ways that we should behave in various contexts. And and sometimes um, it will shape in us contradictory urges. Hmm. So, so in the case where, um, right, so it doesn't build into us a desire for eating the right nutrition. Rather, right. it builds in us um, a desire for, you know, if so, for example, in our hunter-gatherer days, yes, um, it wasn't easy, often, to come across a rich food source, right, and and starvation was far more frequent back yes. then. So, a very very good strategy given those kinds of shaping circumstances, is if you run across a big food source, eat a lot, hmm. right? You eat a lot because you don't know when you're going to get the next one. Right. So now that strategy is a very effective strategy when um, you're in a context where food uh, yes. is They're scarce scarce or, or, or unreliable. Right. But today we have 24-hour uh, fast food McDonald's and <laughs> the whole thing has changed. Exactly right. So in our context, see, that a strategy which is good in one context, uh -huh. in a different context, turns out to be dysfunctional. Okay. And so now we can have obesity, diabetes, hmm. and all these things. But but hmm. the the program was – so so that's why evolutionary psychologists talk about um, we have to look at the context in which the module evolved in us. And right. was it adaptive in that, that context? Right. But But – even within a given context, we could have contradictory um, modules that, that are yes. activated. So hmm. I might, uh, for example, with a brother or a sister, um, they're, they're, I share 50% of my genes with my brother or my sister. Right. So there will be, but, but you know, there, there's some notion of altruism that, that's going to come out of that because by yes. taking care of my brother and sister, um, that helps pro hmm. propagate. 50% of my own genes, yes, right? Right. Uh, on the other hand, my mom and dad, at least during the Pleistocene and so forth, maybe, um, again, um, they had limited time, limited resources. Right. Maybe uh, only one of us is going to have a get fed. If you know, it's me and my right. brother, right. then maybe I would like it to be me and not my brother. <laughs> right. If you're, the, if you're the favorite brother, right? I mean, who knows right. if you're the one they like. <laughs> exactly right. And so we see a lot that right. there's sibling rivalry. If there's limited resources, right. so you so you have this competition mm -hmm. uh, between two different drives. One mm -hmm. uh, of altruism that that would come there because right. you know your brothers and sisters share your dreams, genes, but also the, the different drive saying I, I need to find my brother. In mm -hmm. in the extreme case, right. uh, there's a, a bird called the blue-footed booby. Mm -hmm. The the mother lays two eggs. And the, the two chicks, um, the first item of business is they peck each other until one of them dies. Right. They fight to the death. That's the very first thing they do. Often one pecks, bloodies the other one, puts it out in the sun, and it bakes to death. Hmm. The mother is watching and does nothing to stop it. She hmm. killed her sibling. Wow. And now from an evolutionary point of view, the way to understand that is that in the niche in which the blue-footed booby is evolved, Right. Um, there are not enough nutrients. There's not enough resources 
to successfully raise right. two chicks. So the strategy then is to have two chicks and let just one mm -hmm. survive by right. proving that it's the strongest. That way you keep the species strong with the genes. So you have, in the case of the blue-footed booby, a, a choice between extinction yes. or siblicide. Now, for humans, siblicide yes. is a horrible thought. It right. seems, just seems wrong. Exactly. But when you have this evolutionary you know, dilemma, right. then you get these kinds of behaviors. So it, it, when you look at evolution, it's, uh, it, it's very, very complicated. Right. Um, well, how about I mean, humans? You know, we see people that stay in abusive relationships where they're actually being beaten up by their spouse and, you know, very self-destructive. So I'm wondering, what's evolutionary uh, adaptability, adaptability of that since you're, you're hurting yourself? Are you saying that well, the love is their their illusion? Maybe they think the person will change or something. Well, um, from evolutionary theory, again, um, it, and, and by the way, I'm, when I say that I'm talking within evolutionary theory, I, yes. I'm not saying that evolutionary theory is right or the right. or the final answer. Yes. I'm, I'm just trying to say what that theory tells yeah. us, right? That, yeah. As a scientist, he says the best science that, available right now. He that, that's, that's the best science that we have available, yeah. and of course. Um, Maybe we'll find a better theory <laughs> later on. It'll have to explain everything that evolutionary right, theory right. explains, yeah. and then more. But, but right, because humans are so, kind of complex. I mean, sometimes things that we don't understand. <laughs> that, oh, uh, I, yeah, it, it doesn't happen every day that someone's a genius enough to actually get yeah. a new theory, right? That, that's, of course, of course. You, 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 we think about Einstein and yes. Newton and people right. like that who do it. So, right. right. So if I could but, just, uh, I mean, for the layperson, this idea of simplifying this complexity so we can make you survive better, right? You know, finding the little niches, the little techniques, um, I guess the heuristics, you know, rules of thumb that help us right. find something. Instead of, you know, checking every little thing, we check uh, X number of things that might help us find what we want. So I can see that could be an advantage, but on the other hand, things like availability heuristics. So you see a plane crash uh, and immediately it's in your head, so you're afraid of uh, flying in planes. So that could be maybe self-defeating. Or maybe things like stereotypes, right? You stereotype people based on race or ethnicity or something based on certain characteristics. That could be a negative too. For example, right now, Donald, I only see three books over here in your bookcase, so I don't know if you're that smart. Is that true? Right. And, and, and it's not even certain I've even read all those books either. Oh, is that, exactly, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, of course, that's not true, right, because you're, uh, you're a genius guy. But uh, so how does that work? I mean, can these heuristics also go against our evolutionary ability to, you know, to reproduce? Well, that, that's a really good question. Um, and I'll give another fun example. It's um, hmm. the jewel beetle. Yes, so, so the the jewel beetle um, is this um, beetle that's uh, dimpled, glossy, and brown. Yes. And it lives in the outback of, of Western Australia. And the, the males fly, the females are flightless. Right. But the males fly around looking for eligible females, and, and if he finds one, he, he alights and mates. And, um, but it turned out that if you just throw out, there's certain beer bottles that they call stubbies in Australia. Yes. And so a lot of you know Australian guys mm -hmm. who drive through the desert just toss these stubbies out. Are you a beer drinker, um, Donald? Or no? uh, uh, well, I, I have some now and then, but not very much. Not too much. Um, okay. Often, it, yeah, it doesn't agree with me too much, but but I'll have a little bit now and then. Okay. But but so these guys, you know, they throw these these bottles on the desert, and it turned out that the bottles were dimpled, glossy, and just the right shade of brown yes. to grab the fancy of these beetles right. and what they found was that the the male jewel beetles mm. would flock all over these bottles trying to mate right and the species almost went extinct because the real females wow. were not nearly as attractive as the beer bottles i mean it's a <laughs> classic okay. case of the okay. male leaving the female for the bottle kind of right? interesting. wow okay. <laughs> i like this it's a double so, entendre right <laughs> yeah double, double, double entendre that's right so so what's going on here right because the, the species would have gone extinct, but they had to actually, you know, alter the, the beer bottles oh. to to. Oh. So here, you, uh. what, what's going on? The male jewel beetles had, for thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of years, right. successfully found and mated with females. You would right. think, well, that's because evolution you know, trained the sensory systems of right. the male jewel beetles to know what a yeah. real female is. Right. Well, apparently not. What the Everything gets done as cheaply as possible uh -huh. in evolution, right? That's one right. of the principles. You, cheaply you meaning that it costs you less time and energy, like you said, uh, resources and all that. that that's right. Yeah. So you try to – we have these heuristics, as you mentioned, the heuristics yes. that, that, that are shortcuts right. that save time and energy. Right. And as long as the heuristics work in your niche, hey, right. that's all you need. Okay. And so the, the jewel beetle apparently had a heuristic right. that a female – Jewel beetle right. is anything dimpled, glossy, and brown. Right. And apparently, it liked bigger, bigger things were better. Yes. And right. so, because these big, 
glossy brown dimpled j- bottles yeah, the more were attractive. bigger and so yeah. forth. They, yeah. they uh, checked all the boxes. Yes. So evolution didn't give you an insight into reality. It gave right. you a few check boxes. Check, I check, see. check. Okay, that's a female. Try to mate with it. Right. So heuristics, would you say, work 80% of the time? They must work a lot because people, you know, they keep doing it, right? They keep using the same things. Um, well, 99% of all species yes. that have been on the earth are now extinct. Wow. So we're the only ones and maybe a few dogs or something, right? That's it? Or, well, yeah, so, so. <laughs> it's from, from an evolutionary point of view, yes. um, we're, humanity is a recent experiment right. and um, very unlikely. Yeah. Is, is it working the experiment or are we not working? No. Well, um, when you and I were kids, right. the experiment almost terminated. Yeah, nuclear war. Right. The, the Cuban <laughs> Missile Crisis, right? Exactly. Yeah. We came within minutes right. of the experiment being well, over. Well, but today I'm thinking, you know, since we spoke last, we're in the pandemic. Right. And people are now in fear, you know, economically, health-wise, um, you know, division, things like that. Right. And uh, one thing we talked about last time is the idea of the lion versus the rabbit. If you recall, you told me the lion sleeps 18 hours a day because it's the king of the jungle, right? It has no fear. Uh, and then the rabbit, so looking around because it can be eaten by anybody. And then I asked you, how do you, we, how do we become lions if we're kind of rabbitish? And nowadays, a lot of people, maybe the world has become more of a rabbit, you know, more fearful and anxious. And I think we talked about uh, things like meditation. Right. And you told me you meditate three hours a day. So that's uh, what we call counter conditioning, where we associate positive things and relaxation with with the stimulus that's fearful. But I'm wondering, are there other things we can do? Because some some people may be more genetically hardwired for fear uh, than right. others, uh, anxious and that kind of thing. Uh, so things like cognitive behavioral therapy, which our right. associate uh, Novako worked a lot with, where we change your thought process, uh, say, you know, what's the worst thing that could happen if this ha- thing happens? And most mm-hmm. of the time, it's not as bad as you think. So that's kind of a rational or irrational thinking or acting despite the fear. So from your standpoint, scientifically, what can people do now in our, our pandemic to become more of a lion and less of a rabbit? Right. Well, I, I, I agree with what, what you just said, that there are... Um, Techniques, for example, the meditation where you actually are are reducing your cortisol levels, right. reducing the the anxious thoughts. Going well, now you said you meditate three hours a day, which blew me away. How do you do that? Yes, uh, you know that's kind of uh, you know pretty amazing. Are you a Buddhist monk or anything, or martial arts expert? Or, yeah? No, I'm <laughs> I'm not a devotee of any religion. Okay. I'm I'm not opposed to religions. Yes, but I'm not a devotee of any religion. Um, okay. I I certainly. And I'm open to listening to spiritual ideas, yes. um, as long as they're not dogmatically put out. Um, right. But how do you do that? I mean, I'm, th- I'm sitting here, most people, in five minutes, their monkey mind. You know, the Eastern philosophy talks about the chattering mind. Right. You know, I got to pay bills. I got to do this tomorrow. You're a busy guy as a professor and, you know, scientist. So how do you uh, still that busy monkey mind when you meditate? Well, it, um, I go into silence, and when the thoughts come up, and I notice that they've come up, um, it's easy to then beat yourself up and say, oh, you know, and, and, and to punish yourself for, for not doing it right and so forth. So then I look at that as well. I look at that whole process and just watch the process and then gently go back into silence. And it's really um, relaxing. Right. At a de- so it's relaxing the body, mm. but it's also relaxing the mind. So it's not trying to get rid of thoughts. Yes. It's, it's like if I say, well, I want you to really try hard to relax. Yes. Well, that's sort of silly. You, you either relax or you don't. But if you're trying to relax, then you're trying. You're not relaxing. Right. And so, so, so it's, it's what you learn in the process is to let go and relax the body, to let go and relax the mind, to, to relax away from thoughts. As opposed to trying to get rid of thoughts, you, you just relax away and, you, and, and just become the watcher. Um, the, the watcher that isn't beating yourself up, um, but then when, when I when you look, you actually then also see all the the thoughts that are coming up, the programs that come up. I mean, you get a, uh, I get an insight into. Not only you don't have enough time in the day to sit there for three hours to meditate, says the the irrational th- or the, you know, the thought. Uh, you got so much to do. You got to write papers. You got to be on Doctor Ivan's show. You got to be on a hundred other shows. What are you doing, Donald? Says the thought. What do you say to oh, the thought? A- absolutely, and and it it's very critical, I, I think, to spend the time taking care of yourself, um, because it's n- number one, it's good for your health, but number yes. two, 
Um, that's where the creativity comes from. Okay. So create, creative stuff comes not just from reading and thinking hard. You, right. you mean, that's a big part of it. So I have to spend time studying and, and yes. doing rational analysis. Yes. But then there's this other side, um, going into pure silence and going into a space where there's no thought at all also right. seems to tap another side of creativity that's mm. extremely wow. powerful. And right. so it's a balance. So you're talking back to the thought as we speak, right? You're saying these things like, I'm more creative. I'm more evolved, you know, and things like that when I'm meditating. Uh, now, the other thing is, Donald, you talk about evolutionary game theory. Right. Uh, the fact that natural selection has certain strategies that help you, you know, live long enough to mate and reproduce and pass your genes. And here's an interesting um, premise you have. You say, if you perceive reality accurately, you are not likely to survive as much as if you are tuned to these fitness uh, pals we're talking about, you know, the shortcuts and things like that. And you talk about things like certain factors, like the state of the organism, uh, and also the type of organism. For example, if you put a steak uh, in front of a lion, it's hungry, it's going to devour it. If it wants to mate, and if it's full of food, it's not going to necessarily be that hungry. Or if you put it in front of a rabbit, uh, the steak, you know, they're not going to eat it because that's not what they eat. Uh, so I'm wondering in terms of personality types, are there certain personalities, and I wrote a book called Love Types on Jungian Topology and Myers-Briggs. Uh, what we call the uh, optimist, for example, is someone that looks at the best of things. So they're actually going to be open to new experiences. Maybe they can meet new people and have a fortunate circumstance. But they're also maybe going to ignore certain dangers because they're so optimistic. As opposed to the pessimist who's very realistic, right? They see all the little problems, you know, they get life insurance, they go to the doctor. But then they're more pessimistic about meeting new people. You know, that's not going to work out. So who of those has the evolutionary advantage, do you think? The optimist or the pessimist? Well, it depends on the context, and that's mm -hmm. the interesting thing about evolution. Yes. There's no such thing as the right strategy or uh, the best strategy. Mm -hmm. And from an evolutionary point of view, what, what evolution does is have mutations for lots of different emotional strategies. So, yes. so I tend to be more, uh, uh, more anxious, a little bit um, mm -hmm. introverted and so forth. Right. My brother tends to be... He's, he's more robust physically than me, mm -hmm. and he's, he's a little bit more you know, confident right. and, you know, physically and socially and so, okay. and so forth. So, so who's going to pass along their genes more, you or your brother, do you think? Well, it depends on the context. I'll give you mm -hmm. a really concrete example of yes. this. I mean, uh, so there's a, a suite of genes called the warrior genes, mm. and um, these tend to make a person, um, a, a man, um, a sociopath. Really? Okay. Uh, you know, physically um, capable of violence, wow. um, uncaring about other people's feelings, mm. wow. and unfazed by seeing brutality. Mm. Um, and so they have very few moral compunctions. Mm. And it, it, I have a friend um, who, who studies this. He's a, a, a very famous neuroanatomist here at UCI. Yes. And he was studying this, and, and he was looking at the brain scans of, of people, and, and he right. could actually see from the scans of people and other tests wow. um, who who might have the, this warrior suite. And right. He, but it was all, of course, um, coded, so you didn't know who the right. scan was because it's for privacy. But wouldn't a warrior be good in war? I mean, there are circumstances where you need a warrior right, at times. And, and that's going to be the point to your question. I was going to say. <laughs> So it, it, well, it, I'll just say what happened with Fallon, then I'll say what, what happened. So, yes. so, so my friend Jim Fallon was doing the study, and he um, found this one scan. There, so this is really this person's got, got a serious case. We have to actually unmask the data here so we can tell this person they've got a wow. problem. So he unmasked the data, and it was him. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my, you know, he's a good friend of mine, and Jim is a wow. he, he's he's a sociopath. Really? And okay. and. Um, hmm. and what goes on with these, hmm. with the genes? But does here, he get in trouble legally or ethically or morally? Or well, it turns out if you are, if you have these genes and your parents were very, very loving, ah. you can grow up to be ah. normal. And and he was, uh, right. um, he was, a, he's brilliant. He's one of the world's right. premier neuroanatomists, a, a, a faculty member here, a right. brilliant career. Right. So he, but but I also got the sense that I don't want to cross him. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Definitely. But, but the, the thing is, it appears that women mm -hmm. are more attracted to men right. who evidence this sociopathic gene. The, the bad boys uh, phenomena. That they, like, bad boy, the, yeah. Yeah, this particular kind of bad boy, right. when they're in situations that, where, they're, where it's dangerous. Like ah. if there are middle, like in the Middle East, where right. 
maybe there's a lot of violence going on between some groups in the, that's going to history right. of that. Right. Then women are automatically more attracted mm -hmm. s statistically to these warrior men right. with the words, and so right. the gene gets passed on and and, and tends right. to be more pervasive, because right. I mean, you, you want a, a, someone with a war. You don't want a Hoffman. Who is not going to be a warrior? In the Middle East uh, wartime. The huh? Middle East is not going to work, right? So, but you see, I had a cocktail party uh, talking about f physics or something. You want Hoffman? Then maybe Hoffman, right? But, <laughs> okay. but not not when someone's out there fighting, you know, and your life is right. on the line. Exactly. So, so, so you can see why. It depends on the environment. You're saying. Do, there's yeah. no one perfect strategy. Right. You know, maybe Hoffman is great in Irvine, yes. but but Fallon is great in, in a war zone, right? And, exactly. and there's no right answer. Yeah. Well, you know, the MMPI, you know, people have certain elevations of certain of those uh, traits. But for example, you know, psychopathic deviant or sociopath is elevated among criminals and some law enforcement that do well with them because they can yeah. move beyond feeling guilty. You know, they can take action and, and you know, kind of counteract it. So uh, it, it can be useful in certain circumstances. You know, war, I guess, would be something. So I see what yeah. you're saying. So it kind of depends on the context and the environment. Now, I was thinking like also the, the practical person. Now, you said the person is very realistic and they see all the details, they're not going to pass along their genes as opposed to the person that's more intuitive that, you know, goes by the gut hunch. But I think it could backfire too, because you go by your gut hunch, you can make more mistakes, but maybe you cut through it quicker. But then the sensory person who's detail oriented can get all the details, but then they miss the big picture. So again, is that something that can affect as well? Who of those may have the best chance of, uh, you know, reproducing anyway? It, 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 exactly. And, and I think from the point of view of, of evolution, it's, it's sort of wise to just have variations of all kinds, right? Ah, okay. Because you, you don't know what's going to come down the pike. Right. And and maybe the person who acts fast yes. and gets it right most of the time. Like the gut hunch, time, you know. Yeah. They, they might actually, because they're fast, they might survive. Right. Whereas other situations, you might need to be someone who's really, really careful. Methodical and careful, yeah. And, and methodical. And yes. so there, there's no one right answer. And what you hmm. see throughout Right. Uh, nature is a, a variety of strategies right. that, that, that are put out there. And even with this variety of strategies, 99% of all species go extinct. Wow. So, so even that isn't a guarantee of the survival right. of that particular mm -hmm. kind of right. species. Well, well that explains the whole psychological type phenomena. You know, the sensor versus the intuitive, the, the thinker versus the feeler. Depending on the circumstance, they could be very valuable and you know, very productive. Uh, right. So we need everybody, right. right? You're saying we need a rainbow, a different personality, you know, types and things like that. Exactly. And and the kind of benefit that I get from meditating in terms of, yeah. of being you know, calmer and, and so forth, uh, Jim Fallon probably doesn't need it. <laughs> right. He, 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 <laughs> By the way, is he okay with this? Is, is he going to get mad at you and uh, come at you? Or not? <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. No, no. Jim and I are good friends. And, oh, and okay. no, he, yeah, he's, he's a good guy. So, so you know, you're kind uh, of joking. You're, you're joking, but you're serious at the same time. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So, so I mean, Jim may not need meditation as much as me, yes. simply because his genetic endowment is, is very, very, very different from mine. Right. And exactly. so we each. That's why one size does does not fit all in psychotherapy and yes. in spirituality. Right. What you know, what I do for my spiritual practice may be just not what you need to do in your spiritual practice. And each True. one of us right. needs to really stand on our own two feet, right. really become in touch with who we are. Yes. And what, what our own pathway for growth is, because right. e even your brother and your sister can be very, very different genetically right. and personality right. from you. And so what's right. right for you. So I would not recommend people spend three hours necessarily. Exactly. Like I well, well, I love that but idea, you know, to thine own self be true. That's when I talk about love types and personality types is to embrace who you are and then find yes. your niche in the world. Because many times we don't do that, right? We feel bad about ourselves. I'm a sensitive male, for example. I'm a feeling male. That's really you know, uncommon in society or vice versa, thinking female or introverts and extroverts. Now, the other thing, Donald, is interesting. Uh, this is an interesting idea. You say, uh, in some ways, that is the world a liar? You talk about deception as being something that is part of the selection uh, process, you know, the selection pressure. And you have an interesting uh, um, example. You talk about the um, the orchids. I think they call the bee orchids that orchids, yeah. shape themselves as very attractive females, and then it attracts the, these bees that come and get the pollen. Uh, and then pass it on to other flowers to reproduce without realizing it. So they're being like tricked in a sense and deceived. Although I read to, they said that these actually flowers are actually self-pollinating as well. So they don't really need that. So why would they even do the trick if they don't need it? 
Well, um, of course, self-pollinating doesn't give you as much variety as pollinating with other flowers. Ah, and so, okay. so they probably have the self-pollinating as a fallback when, ah. when everything else fails. Okay. But, but what you really want is the variation. Of, I see. Uh, so, but isn't so that kind of mean that you're tricking the poor bees? I mean, that's not very nice, is it? You know? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> so Madison Avenue wasn't the first to use false advertising. <laughs> It was you know, flowers were doing it yes. millions of years before okay. for Madison Avenue was doing it, right? Um, and and it works, right? So you you have orchids that are shaped, um, and so that they trick a bee into thinking that they're they're female bees. They might even have a a, a, a perfume. Yeah, they have a that, sense that, as well. Yeah, yeah. That, that, tra that tricks them as well. Yes. Um, of course, humans do. We use makeup. Makeup is mm -hmm. a lot, right? You, you, um, yes. but, but what's interesting about makeup hmm. um, is that the lie is often more effective than the real thing. So, hmm. uh, for example, lipstick. Right. Um, perfectly done red lips with lipstick. Yes. You're, you're seeing lips that would never exist in nature. Huh? That, that doesn't happen in nature. Hmm. And yet, yes. for men, yes. right, that, that looks really attractive, yes. perhaps more attractive than anything no. that would be real. Exactly. And that's called a supernormal stimulus. And okay. we find supernormal stimuli all mm -hmm. throughout nature. So, for example, right. uh -huh. there's a um, the gray lag goose. Mm -hmm. The mother sits on her, her um, eggs, speckled right. eggs and so forth. But you can take a bigger rock, mm -hmm. speckle it just right, mm -hmm. and put it, and she will leave her eggs and sit on <laughs> it because it, she's got a little algorithm, bigger is better. Uh -huh. Wow. Or, or better speckles okay. is better. Right. And so right. so in some sense, you go, how stupid can you be? You're right. sitting uh -huh. on a rock on and a you could, <laughs> it's bigger than you could ever let. You couldn't lay right. an egg that big. Don't, can't you get it through your thick skull that that right. couldn't right. possibly be an egg? Exactly. No, she's got uh, she's got right. this algorithm and right. it's a super normal stimulus. Right. So makeup, it creates a super normal stimulus that, that gets mm -hmm. men. And and you see this all throughout nature. So right. so And the male way, peacock about, has beautiful flowers too, right? Very beautiful colors. They attract Absolutely. The, they attract and, the females. I've actually consulted for companies, Did you? advertising companies, wow. where I, I tell them how this works hmm. because advertising is about grabbing attention and, and making things look attractive. So once right. you know what these supernormal stimuli are and how to grab attention, right. so, so the stuff I'm talking about hmm. um, is not just abstract evolutionary theory for geeks. Hmm. Um, hmm. Companies pay me. <laughs> to tell them exactly how to do this, and wow. it works, and they make okay. they make tons of money That's using this stuff because this is how you make advertising that works. Yeah. You also mentioned the the, the strongest um, deception is self deception. So I'm wondering, well, can that be used therapeutically? Like, if you're not confident, can you trick yourself into feeling confident? I mean, how do you apply this in everyday life? So, well, so the argument that we've been programmed by evolution to be self deceived is is. Um, due at least in part to a, a brilliant theorist named Robert Trivers. Right. And he pointed out that that um, we're a species that's mostly cooperative, right? right. We hunted and gathered together, and um, I might go out there and not succeed today. I might hunt and fail, but you hunt and you've got a whole wildebeest, so you got more than you need. I've got right. less than I need, right. and so I ask you, you share, and then tomorrow, you know, if, if it tables yeah. are turned, I'll share with you. Right. So there's this cooperation. Right. But that, and, and that, that's a really good strategy, cooperation. Right. But it turns out when you do evolutionary game analysis, if everybody's cooperating, mm -hmm. then if you're a cheater, ah. you just, you, if you mm -hmm. pretend to cooperate and you go out ah. there like everybody else to hunt, but right. what you really do is you sit down by the river and just relax right. yes. and don't put yourself in any stress. Right. Or, you, you, know, you live longer probably that way too. You yeah. live longer, you come back, right. you go, oh, I tried, right. I couldn't get any, <laughs> could I have some of yours? Right. It turns out that that strategy is even more fit. If everybody right. else is cooperating, right. it's more fit right. to be a liar and right. deceive and so, but now, but, but unless they catch you, what if they catch you and string you up on the tree? I mean, that's another option, right? Well, so so that's where you get this evolutionary arms race now. Yes. So right. what happens is, um, if if everybody becomes a cheater, right, then the society will collapse. Right. Exactly. Our society hasn't collapsed, so yes. we haven't all become cheaters. Well, uh, well what's going on there? So yes. the cooperators then would have to evolve a way to detect the cheater and punish them, right? So they don't do it. And punish them. So that's where you get the evolutionary hmm. um, origin of moral emotions. Right. Wanting to um, punish, punish, revenge, right. anger at, 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 at doing right. things wrong. Right. But but what happens then is you get an evolutionary arms race. The, hmm. the cooperators 
get better at detecting cheaters, wow. but the cheaters get better at, at hiding their mm. cheating, uh, their, their deceptions, right? right. And, and Trevor says, what's the ultimate right. best deceiver? Ah. The one who lies to themselves. Ah, okay. Because they it, believe it, and then they're not really cheating. Then. Never, never mind. But, right, yeah, it's like um, George in, in Seinfeld. You're right. It's not a lie if you believe it. Right? Okay. Interesting. Right. Wow. So, but, well, so that's what, what, what right. Trippers argues is that right. we have been, so So his, this is the really stunning argument, then. Right. All of us have been shaped by natural selection mm -hmm. to so deeply lie to ourselves about mm -hmm. our real right. motivations mm -hmm. that we don't even know that we're lying. Wow. So self-deception, according to this, is deeply rooted into us. And so right. that's why we should assume, and I assume, right. that my beliefs about my motives right. and why I'm doing what I'm doing right. are almost surely mm -hmm. false. So, Donald, why are you doing this all this work of theoretical conscious realism and all that? I mean, tell me the real reason. Well, I'm very interested um, in consciousness. And I'm, I'm, I've been very interested in science, and I've been very happy to study the physicalist theories of science, the general relativity. Was well, there a deeper reason? Like, were you, as a kid, you love science, or your dad spent a lot of time with you in science? I mean, can you pick, picture something that really got you into it? Well, um, my dad wasn't a scientist. He's a, he he's a minister, a right? Minister? Who's well, yeah, he had a master's degree in chemistry. Okay. And he, he worked as an engineer at various companies, and right. and but he did um, show an interest in science. He was he was interested in science. My mom was a programmer, and okay. she was a, a very talented programmer. So I, I got that influence. My the, my dad became a minister, um, and so I was raised in a very fundamentalist Christian okay. environment. You think you um, rebelled against them and got into science as a result? I I didn't rebel against it. I was. Um, I, I got into the science at the same time, and mm -hmm. then I had both. I had the science and, and this fundamentals Christianity stuff, right. which has some good good yeah. stuff, but some weird stuff in it. <laughs> so it took me a long time to sort her. out, okay. you know, what what to keep and, and not keep from the science right. and from the spiritual right. from right. Christianity right. stuff. Exactly. So it, it, you know, it, I was forced by my own background to eventually step back from both. Ah. And, um, you know, and what I took from science was rigor, precision yes. in your thoughts, yes. and making hy hypotheses that are precise so that you can test them, and doing right. careful, so in other words, no nonsense, yes. no hand waves, absolute precision, and I right. really love that from science. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, what I got from the spiritual side was there may be more to life than just space, time, and matter. Okay, something beyond it. <laughs> there, there could be something beyond. I see. I see. But what what I didn't like was the imprecision of the thought and right. a lot of... Um, mm. Faith and belief, I guess. Is faith and, and dogmatism. I feel right. like the dogmatism is mm. really self-defeating. Right. But, but how about but this, uh, Donald, the idea of morality in a positive way, because if you're talking about deception, what if you say, women lie to men that I love you so they have security... Men lie to women, I love you, so they have sex. I mean, actually, that, that would be a very immoral society in some ways. I mean, is that an evolutionary thing that could happen? Well, it absolutely could happen, and, and obviously we, we see it happening. We, that very thing that you're talking about. To a certain extent, right, yeah. But it's not like that, not everyone. You said they're not all cheaters in the world, right? Maybe a, a percentage, right? Right. But, but um, so there's going to be, again, various strategies, and, and part of that is going to turn out to be, it turns out from evolutionary evidence, it depends on the kind of family you were raised in, your family system, right. and but also the strategy. See, from an evolutionary point of view, all that that matters. And again, I'm I'm not saying from a moral point of view right. or a deep spiritual point of view. I'm just right. saying from evolutionary theory. pure biology. Yeah. Pure biology. What what it says is whatever strategy you use right. that allows you to get more kids. Yes. Right. Makes is a reproduce. successful strategy. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. That's what that that's how you define success in evolution. It's not happiness. Right. It's not emotional security. It's not emotional balance. It's right. how many kids do you have? Right. So now think about two very very different strategies. Yeah. One is for for example from a, for a man to um, not settle down with any one woman right. to have um, 
children with as many women as possible and not support any of them. Right. You call it Genghis Khan, you told me last time. The Genghis Khan, yeah, uh, that's, that's the extreme. Right, thousands right. of women or you know, thousands of babies. Yeah. Right. Now, 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 because the man isn't helping to support each of those children, right. each particular one has less of a chance of surviving. Because right. on the other hand, if you have many children, you have a good chance of having a lot survive. That's one strategy. The other extreme would be to have um, commitment to one person, one woman, have a few kids, right. and put all of your time and energy into raising those yes. those few kids. Those are two different strategies. Right. Like a Tom Hanks versus the Genghis Khan, say, for example. It, 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 exactly The family right. guy, and, you know, versus that. Right. And from an evolutionary point of view, uh, again, the the um, not speaking from a moral or spiritual point of view, whichever strategy works to lead to the greatest number of offspring in the next generation, right. that's success. And so For the that's why we find different strategies in humans. Yes, exactly. Now, uh, I want to bring in my producer, Reggie. Uh, Reggie, uh, this guy loves your work. Uh, he's okay. um, self-proclaimed, kind of scientific, uh, nerdy kind of guy. Hi, Reggie. <laughs> he's a hey, graduate. Um, Reggie, uh, you have a question for um, Dr. Hoffman. Uh, what, what is your question? Okay, yeah. So, um, well, um, you, uh, as you've been going over, you proposed that um, what we are, what humans perceive is not objective reality. It's rather um, our perception at reality. And um, I mean, I was just thinking, um, just um, say like, so if multiple people um, share the same or similar perception of an object or an experience, um, can it be argued that said object or experience has some objective quality independent of our perception of it? Well said, Reggie. Oh, he, he, he challenged the professor. Here's the oh. student that raised her oh. hand. Oh, so. uh, absolutely. That, that's exactly what you want is hard questions like that. Good. So, so that, that's a great question. And I, I, Thank you. I think, that, think about it again in a virtual reality context, right? So suppose that um, I'm playing Grand Theft Auto with you, and there's, there's a, two dozen of us playing Grand Theft Auto. And I look over and I say, oh, yeah, do you guys see that red Ferrari over there? And everybody goes, yeah. Oh, yeah, I see the red Ferrari. Well, does that mean that there really is an objective red Ferrari? No. <laughs> It means that we all are wearing the same headset, and we have all the same interface. So if we all share the same interface, then we will we'll all agree. And so that's what happens as a social group. We, we have evolved to agree, but that doesn't mean we're seeing the truth. It just means that we have the same interface. Oh, okay. Well, that makes that, thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I appreciate that, Dr. Hoffman. Now, now Dr. Hoffman, I'm going to ask you a question personal to Reggie, and the question is going to be interesting, maybe a little shocking. But let me give you some background. Reggie here is a wonderful guy, but he's extremely shy. He's never had a real romantic sexual relationship um, in his life, you know, a couple of dates. Uh, so why is he alive? <laughs> and I'll say that because shy people make up 45% of the population. Why isn't shyness uh, no longer a trait since it doesn't, mm. uh, not conducive to reproduction? Right. Well, th th there's a number of different answers to that. Um, yes. What, I'm, was, I'm glad you're alive, by the way, Reggie. Oh, thank so, you, so. Dr. Avila. I appreciate that. <laughs> but what's really quite interesting is that um, when we were hunter-gatherers, there were strong selection pressures on us. You had to be very, very strong. Strong, yeah. Very quick, very intelligent. Mm -hmm. You had to be... Um, Alpha male, they call it, the macho. Rest of a meth yes. towards women and, and, and so yes. forth. Uh, and you had to be able to take care of yourself because you only were with a small group. You had to make your own clothes, your own right. food. If you were sick, you had to be able to take care of it. And, and the penalty for not getting it right was you were dead. Right. And but you wouldn't perhaps, pass along the genes uh, supposedly the genes. that you didn't have it. Right yeah. but, but now in the last twelve to 15,000 years, right, we got so smart, we created ag agriculture twelve right. to 15,000 years ago. Right. And we got into these big social groups, and that – reduce the selection pressures on our species, hmm. right? We, we weren't dying all the time like we were before because right. now I don't have to do everything for myself. We have a big social safety net. Joe over there, he's making my clothes. Tom, he's the physician. He knows how to take care of me when I'm sick. Mary, you know, she knows how to do this kind of cooking, right. and I don't have to do it all for myself. Okay. Well, what happens then is if you have this social net, there are less selection pressures on the individual. What's going to happen? You, clear prediction. Our brains should shrink and our bodies should become weaker. Mm, okay. But should we become shyer? Because shyness, though, means you're not going to approach someone. You're not going to mate. Right. 
and have children. It's going to allow shyness to, to proliferate, to, to whereas proliferate. it might not have proliferated before. Okay. And if you look back, it turns out you can measure the skull the volumes, yes. the, the cranial volumes of our ancestors for the last 12 to 15,000 years. For, for 3 million years, we were going up, 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 and in the last 15,000 years, we've gone flat down. What's mm. special about our species may be that our species is a species whose brains are shrinking at the fastest rate of any species on the planet. Right. That's yeah. what's special. So yeah. we think of ourselves as a species that's getting smarter at the faster. No, no. <laughs> Ours is the species right. whose brain volume is shrinking at the fastest rate for the last 15,000 years, exactly. and our bodies have become less robust. Right. If we, your great-great-grandfather from 12,000 years ago would look at us as dumb wimps. <laughs> dumb wimps compared to them. So, right. so, so, in other words, we got so smart that we created a vast social safety net. And I'm glad for that safety net. Probably we wouldn't be here. None of us would be here without that safety net, right? We would have been the ones that were selected out long ago. But Dr. So Hoffman, the, 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 thing about, uh, the thing about shyness, I wrote a book called The Gift of Shyness. And actually shyness, even though self-consciousness can hurt you, there are a lot of positive traits. The shy people are often sensitive, reflective, and loyal. So I'm thinking right. that actually could be a genetic trait that people desire, you know, in a mate. And uh, they've actually Absolutely. done some studies on that. Uh, and they, for example, people who are kinder and sense of humor are considered more attractive mates and have a gentle gentleness. And of course, you right. remember Darwin talked about survival of the kindest, which is the idea that cooperation and maternal care is an important part of predicting, you know, uh, reproduction and, you know, and safety. And, uh, you know, we actually find that in baby rats, that the moms who lick them more the baby rats have less uh, stress hormones and they actually have stronger immune systems. So there's something to be said perhaps for the kinder, shyer, nice person, would you say, in terms of evolutionary uh, oh, you know, desirability? Absolutely. Uh, just speaking again within the evolutionary framework, I would say that that's, yeah. a, that's a wonderful strategy. Yes. The, the, but as we've talked about, the, the sociopathic gene is also a strategy, right, that works <laughs> in certain, certain context. But, but I would, I mean, I think that you're pointing to something that's a, a deeper question too, and that is that, you know, Evolution aside, is there some deeper notion of morals that, that, that we should be think, striving to understand here? Yes. Right? And, and, I, and I myself am very interested in the notion of right and wrong that, that handles not just human behavior, but, but all behavior of all animals. Right? Is there some deeper philosophical or spiritual framework for understanding the notion of, of morality and right and wrong yes. that would explain why it's wrong for humans to commit civil side right but might end up saying it was okay for the blue-footed booby to commit mm. civil side right. I mean, I'm not sure sure that it would come out that way but what I'm saying is as a scientist and as a human being right. I would like a theory of morality mm. that is not just human centric but explains the notion of right and wrong for all animal behavior not just human behavior. And I, I've never seen anything that comes close yes. to being satisfactory to me. So I myself don't feel like I have something really deep to say about the, a notion of morality that would go to that, that depth. And I, I, I guess I throw that out as a challenge. I like that. Yeah, Can I'll, we come up with a, a theory that's broad yes. enough to cover all biological behavior, yes. not just human? Yeah, I want to talk to you before uh, we end is uh, the idea of religion and spirituality, which I think is a fascinating uh, added to it. But go back to the, the shy uh, issue, also actually introvert issue. Now, introversion is a little different. Introversion is internal energy. I noticed that even before the pandemic, people are becoming more introvert by nature. They say up to 50% of people, you know, they stay home more, everything's on demand, you know, entertainment, food, even relationships, you know, through dating apps. So the question, are we becoming an introvert society or will we become? Because I'm thinking if introverts made with introverts, you know, staying at home, they're going to create more introvert children. And possibly in 20 years, we're going to have 60, 70 percent introverts. Do you think that's possible or likely? Well, I. By the way, thanks, uh, Reggie, for, for oh, coming thank in. You. Okay. Yeah, thank yeah. You. Well, thank you, Dr. Hoffman. Yeah, thank you very much. Great question. Um, thank you. Yeah, no, I think that that kind of um, dynamics could happen, that, that really? we could have selective um, advantages for introverts in the kind of situation that we have right now. Right. Um, and I mean, you mean for, uh, for introverts, no? Staying home yeah, and all that. Introverts. Right. Yeah, Zoom and stuff that we're doing. Like everyone now is uh, Zooming everything, right? They don't leave the house yeah. now. Right? That, that, that's right. So it's, it's – and it could be that I – mean, it, it depends on what uh, people find attractive, right? So if yes. um, 
it's so it's complicated. We're, we're, you know, there's going to be a lot of variety in what women find attractive in men, what men find attractive in, in women. But but if it turns out, for example, that being an introvert still allows a man to be a good provider. Right. Even better, right? Because the, the geeks are making all the money, right? The, the billionaires. That, that, right? that, that, that's, yeah. that's, that's exactly right. So yes. you could imagine in the hunter-gatherer days, right. the introvert who uh, often introversion is, is, is associated with a, a less robust physique. Yes. Not always, but, 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 but at least put it this way, a, a less robust projection of, of your right. physical uh, power. Dr. Hoffman, are, are you an introvert? Do you have a spouse that's introvert by any chance? Um, I'm uh, slightly introverted. Um, okay. Just I'm close to the middle. Oh, okay, yeah. very, very I am too. To actually. Yeah. Slightly introverted, but but no problem. I mean, I yeah. taught classes of 450, 500 right. students, right. just no problem at all. So right. so I'm not. It, it's just a right. smart. What happens though is that I really enjoy being alone and thinking. Quite, right. I, right. I I like the quiet, but I'm perfectly fine. Um, in social situations, but but I wouldn't be fine if I had to be there all the time. I need time. But, but is your do you have a, uh, is your partner introvert or do you have a yeah, partner? my wife um, of, of more than thirty years and uh, uh, she's she's an introvert. She's she's more introverted than I am. Oh, okay. She's, she's okay. an extreme. So now the other thing, Donald, I'm very curious about. The question is: Are machines taking over our our minds and our world? Uh, and I think of uh, do you remember the old movie Terminator? where you have this company um, that actually created a computer, uh, Skynet, and the computer became aware of itself, and the, the humans wanted to turn it off, and the computer started doing nuclear war to stop the humans. Uh, That's a classic movie, Terminator. Right. And uh, I asked you one time, do you think machines, you know, artificial intelligence, right, was programming to think like humans. Can they at some point develop almost a human mind and maybe even take over the world in some way? I think you told me that it's not really possible for unconscious agents to become conscious. But you did say there is some possibility, some kind of portal that we don't know about that could enter into other conscious agents. So tell us about that. Is that is that a feasibility? Right. So, so I would say, for putting the consciousness issue aside just for one moment, I would just say that that artificial intelligence systems, um, just viewed as physical systems, I I see no principled reason for them not to beat us at everything. Oh, really? Wow. I, I'm not saying that they're conscious. I'm just saying that yes. they'll beat us um, at all sorts of abstract reasoning, okay. games, um, figuring out. I, I'm thinking like uh, Uber Eats, you know, like you, you call in and bring your food. Is that going to be a computer someday to bring the food? A robot. I, I see no principled reason why not. Okay. I mean, I... I, I so... Which can be good. I mean, it saves on cost, right? I would think. Absolutely, absolutely. So, yeah, I, I don't think uh, the, all the naysayers who said computers can't do this or that. Uh, right. They've just been proven wrong again and again. And, and right. I, I see no reason why there couldn't be um, artificial intelligences that that routinely win the Pulitzer Prize in wow. okay. um, that build mm -hmm. um, incredible, that write incredible operas, that write incredible poetry. That, that write um, Nobel Prize winning literature. I, I just see no principled reason why that won't eventually happen. Well, can they adapt? Uh, we talked about things like deception and maybe you know taking advantage of others. Can computers become evil in a way? I mean, can they destroy us through, uh, you know, like the, the Terminator thing? Is that, is that far-fetched? It's not far-fetched at all. Uh, I, I think that um, the the way forward here that's going to probably lead to that being a real issue is that AIs are no longer going to be stuck in mainframe computers. They're going out into the wild, right? So Boston Dynamics um, has mobile robots that can do parkour, that, that can do um, all sorts of gymnastics. Wow. They can run. They, in other words, we can put an AI out there in the wild and it can learn on its own. It, wow. it can get its own experiences. And um, I, I see absolutely, again, no obstacle hmm. to them becoming um, faster, better, more efficient, and perhaps more ruthless than us. How, uh, and how, how and I, I was, this, even mating with, um, you know, the idea that beetles, I mean, um, the bees mate with the flowers, 
can people mate with these robots in a sense? Uh, you know, they're very lifelike. Well, there are conferences on that. Love and yeah. sex with robots. Oh, absolutely. Exactly. He's, they're, they're, a friend of mine actually runs one of these conferences. Um, and oh, there, it's actually a, a huge, um, if, if you go online, you'll, you'll find that there's a lot of work being done on building realistic um, robots that, um, and then they're being used for um, sex. But isn't that kind of, some people say it's disgusting and immoral or, you know, it's kind of productive to uh, evolution because you're not going to reproduce uh, robot babies, are you? Well, it, it, exactly. So, what, what's uh, again, what's interesting in this is that this is, again, the case where uh, we, we talked about supernormal stimuli, right? Yes. Right. So, the AI designers can make these robots better than, look, look better and, and more attractive than any real human. Wow. And right, so just like the the bee gets fooled by a flower, yeah. and and tries to mate with a flower, right. that there's nothing different with humans trying to mate with these AIs, and it's the same thing. It's the supernormal stimulus. So once wow. again, it's the idea that we've evolved these tricks mm. and hacks mm. uh, that lead to the possibility of supernormal stimuli that that right. make um, I think it inevitable that the AI robotic love dolls will will actually um, at, at some point be more attractive to many people than, than the real thing. Well, the thing is, uh, you know, people say, well, but wait a minute, love is a whole different concept. You know, love is, um, we're talking about unconditional love, agape. You know, this is a, a maybe a spiritual nature, and you can't really infuse uh, you know, these robots, these machines with that, you know, love, as far as we know. Right, so, so now we're getting into the issue of real consciousness, right? Right. So, so far I've just been skirting that and just talking about what their behaviors could be and, and yeah. so forth. In terms of behavior, I think that there's no, no limits. Now, in terms of real consciousness, um, I, I think that um, it's, it's impossible to start with unconscious ingredients like right. circuits and software yes. and to, from that alone, create conscious experiences like love. Right. Or even the taste of chocolate, or something like that. I think that's a. I think it's impossible. Right. And so, but because I also think that space time isn't fundamental. I think that you know, physical objects are merely our our, our representations in our little headset. They're not right. the fundamental. Re consciousness really is the fundamental reality. So so to be specific, when I say look at my own face in a mirror, right. What I see directly is skin, hair, and eyes. Right. Or if you look at your own face in the mirror, you, all you see is skin, hair, and eyes. But you know firsthand that what you don't see in the mirror, your your loves, your your hopes, your aspirations, your dreams. Right. The, deep, the, the emotional the, the, spiritual elements. The, the, all, all that stuff. All, the rich world of your conscious experiences is hidden behind this simple little thing, the right. human face. This is yes. trivial. What you see is trivial compared to the rich world that, that's right. hidden behind it. Yes. And and so so the idea is that the, the realm of consciousness is the fundamental reality, and space and time and physical objects, including our bodies, are right. merely little icons. Right. They're not. The, they're not the reality, and they're they, they're not the cause of consciousness. Mm -hmm. They're the the user interface tools, the, the visualization right. tools that we use to interact with other consciousnesses. Right. So, so for example, I'm talking with you, yes. and I only see again your face. In fact, only see your face on a screen because we're we're talking right. by Skype. Yes. So, so I'm not what I what I'm seeing on the screen is not your consciousness. I'm right. seeing pixels, and yeah. if I were there yes. in person, I would just be seeing skin, hair, and eyes. I wouldn't be right. seeing your consciousness. But, but the physical thing that I'm seeing right. is a portal into your consciousness, and what you're seeing right. is a portal into my consciousness. And we right. are my consciousness and your consciousness are right. in genuine contact. Right. through this portal. And that's the notion I want to bring to AI. Yes. So with AIs and consciousness, it's not a matter of, uh, the way it's typically thought of, if we could build a complicated enough set of circuits with right. the right software, it'll be complex enough that we, we somehow consciousness emerges you know, by magic. Right. I'm right. saying something different. I'm saying we know that we have certain symbols Yes. That are portals into consciousness. Your body is my symbol, my physical symbol yes. that lets me interact with your consciousness and lets you interact with my consciousness. The question is, once we understand our interface, our headset into right. consciousness, could we rejig, reverse engineer our right. interface and open up new portals into this realm of consciousness? Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And I think the answer is yes. And it may look like AI. When we do it, it may look like artificial intelligence, but it won't be that we took unconscious hardware and got it complicated enough to be conscious. Instead, what we would really have done is we're getting in touch with pre-existing consciousnesses by opening up new portals in our interface into consciousnesses that our interface didn't allow us to see before. Wow. They're, out, they're out there, yes. but we, we couldn't see them. So that's, that, yeah. that's different. And so, by the way, that's why, for, for the students out there that are interested, right. um, we want a mathematical model of consciousness, yes. a mathematical model of how space-time is right. used as an interface. We yes. want to be able to have as all precise so we can reverse engineer the interface. Once ah. we reverse engineer, engineer the interface, yes. the technologies that are going to be available are truly right. amazing. So any yes. students who want to do this, Learn yes. all the math and computer science okay. that you can. Right. And they call you at UC, UC Irvine, right? Where you're at right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm emeritus now, so um, oh, I can oh. point you to other people. Oh, okay, I get it. Now, the other thing is, um, is very fascinating, Donald, is the idea of the internet as kind of a social network. Uh, think of conscious agents, as you referred to. Um, and Pierre de Chardin talked about the Omega Point, you know, unification of uh, humanity, right, through this, this means. And of course, it can be great in many ways, you know, convenience, uh, information, accessibility. But there's an issue now with what we call the cell phones, where people are even addicted to it. Something called nomophobia, which is a fear of being without your phone uh, disconnected. Uh, you see this a lot. 67% of people have it, uh, and 75% of people in their teens, uh, late teens have it. Even 55 and over people have it as well. And they have this, uh, this kind of a phobia of that. And they say that uh, a certain percent of people... Uh, actually, let's say 71% of people sleep with their phone, 44% fall asleep with it in their hand, and 34% would answer the phone during sex and would even give up sex uh, if it wasn't for the phone. You know, so in other words, the phone would be more important. Uh, and they often have obsession with it. Uh, they said that even dopamine is released when you are on the phone a lot. So I'm kind of picturing, is the phone going to be an appendage to our hand at some point? Are we going to have it fused, uh, almost like a robotic appendage? And then babies come out with it. What do you think of that? I mean, what's going on with this thing? <laughs> well, it's it's very interesting. The um, it may be the first step toward a more cyborg kind of situation yeah. where yeah. where we really um, begin to realize that we can augment ourselves in interesting ways. Hmm. I could have. But is it a danger? I mean, are people so obsessed with it that you lose your mind in a way? Like you're checking social media. You know, you're constantly on the phone. Every every second, you send them a message, and you hope something good is going to happen. Or can it be good? You think it's a good or bad in that sense? Well, I don't think that there's a, a single answer that fits everybody. I, I think right. that, of course, any any well, even what I was about to say is too too strong. So, I'll, most of the time, being too obsessed about anything is going right. to be bad for your health. You know, <laughs> the thing is that we we often benefit from the people with those obsessions. You know, someone who is like an Einstein. Yes, yeah, obsessed who, with science. And that was only for, for medicine. Eight years to get one equation. Yes. Right. He obsessed, and thank God he did it. And it was wow. really hard on his health. He right. he, he, he couldn't sleep. He, right. he worried. It, it was really a stressful time. But yeah. he Where's did my producer? You're checking your phone right now. Why are you checking the phone? They're called on the smithing the shards. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So see, he's right. distracted as we speak. Uh, but isn't that also ADHD in some ways? I mean, people have a short attention span. You know, you constantly look at the messages and everything is very fast. Uh, I don't see people reading as much. Now, when we were uh, kids, I would read like eight books, you know, uh, every month or something. Maybe you were the same, right? So I, uh, I did a lot of reading, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. well, I, again, I don't think it's one size fit all, but, but I would say, yeah, I think that for most of us, it's healthy to try to strike a balance, right? The amount of time that we spend with technology versus in person with other people. But but again, I if there's an Einstein out there, I wouldn't want to stop <laughs> that Einstein okay. from doing what they need to do. Or, or, or like a Paul Dirac, right, who was painfully, right. painfully shy and, okay. and socially inappropriate and so forth, and, right. and yet was the discoverer of, you know, antimatter. Right. Right. And, and, and so forth. I mean, so, or Michelangelo so, was hanging from the chapel uh, for, I guess, years to paint the beautiful chapel. Right? That, that, yeah. That's right. So, so the people who we, we owe a lot of our art, a lot of our culture, a lot of our technology to these rare individuals who, 
who, who themselves often pay a big personal price. Um, Boltzmann, who really broke open thermodynamics and, and helped us to really understand um, entropy and, and, and the atomic nature of, of entropy, right. committed suicide when he was 64. Um, so, so in some ways they're sacrificing, like you said, the, there's some animals that sacrifice themselves to save the, the, the community. Right, uh, right. So. And, and, and of course, I'm not myself you know, advocating people to hurt no, themselves or anything like that. But I'm just saying that, that I'm also not advocating a rule that everybody should be completely balanced in their life. Because right, right. If, if, if Einstein were balanced in his life and, and right. had uh, you know, forced to be balanced in his life, we would yes. be missing out on a lot of stuff. Um, That's a good point. <laughs> So a lot of stuff that sounds like it's very situational, like environmentally focused, you're saying. Uh, there's that no one answer, you know, more or less, right? So, now, now, the other thing, uh, Donald, this is something that's pretty fascinating, is we talked about last time your theory of God. I know you were raised with a minister dad. And then uh, we're talking about, is there an objective reality called God? And then you said, well, you're making a mathematical formula uh, to kind of define it as much as you can. And I'm thinking, looking at the, the uh, religious text, there's a lot of numerology. There's a lot of numbers that are interesting. For example, uh, I think it's four in the case creation, you know, the four points, the four winds. Uh, the number seven is perfection, you know, the seven days that to create the earth, they say. Uh, twelve is the God's people, the twelve tribes of Israel, the twelve apostles. And another number, 144,000, is a multiple of 12 as well, which is the infinite number of the say, people, God's people. So uh, people study that. It's an interesting the idea of mathematical equation uh, for God and, and spirituality. The last time you told me something that you uh, define God as a as a um, infinite, how did you say it? Infinite conscious agent. Conscious agent with infinite possibilities and actions. And have you changed? This is like two or three years ago we talked about this. Have you added anything to that theory? A, a, a little bit. So my ideas have evolved a little bit on it. Um, I would say first that there's a difference between a, trying to get a precise scientific theory, mathematical theory of God, yes. versus numerology. Right? Uh, N numerology um, is missing something very, very key to scientific theories, and that is a systematic theory behind it. Uh, it's right. So, so like when Einstein proposed special relativity, behind it was a fundamental principle, namely. The speed of light is the same no matter how what your reference frame is, right? And the, for general relativity, it was a principle that if I'm in an elevator that's free falling, I'll be weightless. And the right. equations that he developed. So, so there's always some deep principle that you then capture with the mathematical. And then what you do is you make clear predictions that you can go test. Numerology right. is is a very very different kind of thing okay. that, that that really is. But is there a way to add, uh, because one thing we talked about briefly last time is, it seems like uh, this idea of love, you know, right. is very essential to all religions. Uh, pure love, uh, right. also known as uh, unconditional love, agape, uh, karuna is compassion in the Eastern way, and also bhakti is devotion. So there are many right. of these uh, terms for, for what we call love, this um, awesome expression uh, without expectation. Right. Uh, so you said you were trying to factor that in. That could be another factor or maybe another uh, part of the equation. Have you worked on that part yet? Right. I've been. So I think that that could, could play a role. But one of the big questions that I've got is if consciousness is fundamental, mm -hmm. what is it up to? Right. What is consciousness about? Right. That's, that's, uh, if, if we're going to have a scientific and precise theory of consciousness, right. yeah. that is a big question you have to write down because – Usually in a scientific theory, you're writing down a dynamical equation. Right. Well, so dynamics means you're doing something. So the question is, what is consciousness doing and why? What, and, and, and to get a scientific theory, what we have to do is have some big idea. Yes. What is the big idea at the very, very core of our theory about what consciousness is doing and why? Right. Mm -hmm. You can see what we, as a scientist... I claim we can't have a genuine scientific theory until we answer that question right. with mathematical precision and show how that leads then to an, the answer to it leads to a mathematical theory of consciousness in the same way that Einstein got a mathematical theory of, of space time from the, the point that, that from the, the principle that, that the speed of light is universal in all reference points. Uh, so you, said, idea about the, the, you, said you, you said you don't believe in your own theories, but do you believe in God? Well, well, I think 
I believe that there's something that I need to work toward to try to understand that that we've used the word God for, but we don't know what we're, what we're talking about, right? So, so, so I would say there. I've only run across one idea, and I think this might have been since the last time we talked. Yes. One idea that's deep enough hmm. to be a candidate answer okay. to to the deep question that I just asked. Yes. I'm not saying it's right, but at least it, I, I put it out there. Um, Maybe it's probably wrong, but to give an idea of the kind of flavor of idea that I think we need to think about so that maybe other people can think of similarly deep ideas. And, and the idea comes from um, a logician named Kurt Gödel. It's, it comes from Gödel's incompleteness theorem. And without going into the details, what Gödel proved back around 1930 <clears throat> is that there is no end to the exploration of mathematical structure in principle. No matter how much mathematical structure you explore, you have only begun. And, and there's no end to it. In, in, in some sense, even quote-unquote God could not know everything there is to know about mathematics. So that's a fundamental theorem. So now so here's, here's how I use it. Suppose, so so that's, that's just a theorem about mathematics. It's endless exploration. Right. Now, let's assume that consciousness is the only fundamental reality. Let's okay. assume. And by consciousness, you mean awareness? Um, yeah, conscious experiences and, and agents with experiences okay. that, that they're acting on. Then, if that's the case, and again, I'm, I'm just speaking as a scientist. Of course, I'm probably wrong, but hey, you know, we just we try things and see if they work. So, so let's suppose there consciousness, a bunch of conscious agents, that's the only fundamental reality. Right. That means, then, that mathematics is only about consciousness. That's the only thing for it to be about, right? But so that means that this unbounded nature of mathematics means that there's endless forms of consciousness mm -hmm. to be explored. So maybe that's what consciousness is about. Mm. It's, it's in principle impossible for consciousness to ever know all the possible varieties of conscious experience. Mm. And so... There's going to be it necessarily an endless exploration, wow. and so I call that Girdle's candy store, right? The candy store, right? There's, if, but it's an infinite candy store. I've I've tasted a few candies, but there's an <laughs> infinite variety more to taste, and so uh, that so that would be, now, so again, I'm not saying I'm right, but but I'm trying to give a flavor of what you have to do right. to at least start to have a scientific theory. So I'm basing it on this a uh, uh, Girdle's theorem, which is clean theorem, there's right. an infinite variety, endless variety of, con uh, of mathematical structures, cannot ever be fully explored. In principle, cannot be fully explored. Right, right. How about the idea is, is when you die and leave your finite body, could you have more of, a, of this bigger picture of this infinite stuff? Maybe even now. Right. One thing I think might be happening in meditation, when uh -huh. I go into silence, Yes is I'm Real allowing state. myself to let go of certain mathematical, certain structures that I already am familiar with oh. and opening myself up to new structures that I've yet to explore. And oh. when you do that, when you really go into complete silence, right. what you're really doing is letting go of everything that's known. Hmm. And that's both terrifying hmm. and exhilarating. Wow. It's terrifying because you're letting go of your teddy bear. Everything you know is your teddy bear. Right. And that's the, you hold on to it. Right. It's exhilarating in the same sense that going on a roller coaster into a dark room is exhilarating. It scares right. the devil out of you, but it, but <laughs> you, you, yeah. you, you know, you're, you're going into the unknown. And yes. I, I have a feeling that that's an inter it, from this point of view, what consciousness is about is this endless exploration in principle endless, of all the possible varieties of consciousness. And, and we're going to have a reticence because it means letting go of what you already know, right. which is terrifying. Mm. But it, and, and meditation is an aspect of that that, that, that helps you to do that. Right. But what you find is you the thoughts come back, it, the teddy bear, you, you cling back onto the teddy bear. I, want, I, I know this, I'm, I'm safe here, I'm not right. safe into the unknown. But maybe you are safe and maybe what consciousness uh, is about mm. is this constant process mm. of going beyond what I already know. First, enjoying what I know now. I mean, so right. 
<laughs> it doesn't hurt to enjoy what you, but at some right. point, now going to the next candy in the candy store. Right. I, I just want to stick with the chocolate. Well, if you just right. stick with the chocolate, you'll yeah. never get the, yeah. the next you month. The the coffee. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. So, right. and there's an endless variety. So, now, again, I'm not saying that this is right, right. but I'm saying it, it needs to be at least this deep before uh-huh. I'm going to take it seriously as a scientist. There's got to be right. some deep principle. And th- now, the way I would take this as a science scientist then is to say, now I'm going to be having a dynamics of exploration of mathematical structures and, and of the consciousnesses. To say infinite exploration is kind of what you're saying. That's right. Now, one thing that you said is interesting, as a scientist, you like to be proven wrong. Right. Some people might say that's self-defeating, but you're just saying that you want to let go of, of things that you think you know to find out what you don't know. Is that the idea? I mean, it's kind of a zazen, no mind kind of thing. You're letting go of these, these preconceptions. Right. If you look back at the history of science, like even just like 120 years ago, most physicists or a, a, a large number of physicists thought that um, we knew it all, that Newton was right, and um, there were a few little odds and ends to, to clean up, but, but we, we had the basic idea. Well, that leads, the, the, the assumption that you are right makes you less inquisitive and less trying to find out where you might be wrong and move on. We, it, it, Newton was not the final word, and the quicker we were to wake up and go, no, it's not. It's as beautiful as Newton is, it's not the final word, but that's, the, that's when you're going to make progress. So I think the right attitude is always just to assume. Uh-huh. Okay. Just assume, yeah. I just mean, I, I'm, not, I mean so I'm not saying I'm, I'm assuming I'm stupid, I'm just I'm saying that you know, assume that all of our best scientific theories and right. all of our spiritual ideas right. are wrong. Yeah, who's that that said uh, at the end of life was a Plato that I know now that I don't know anything? Who's that uh, well, the, the, <laughs> I, I would imagine there are a lot of bright people who come the, the to philosophers. That. That. I think Thomas Aquinas did that at one point. Yes. Um, right. He he actually stopped writing. He was a voluminous writer, but then I think he had his uh, uh, some kind of mystical experience where he realized that everything he could say was was <laughs> not, not, compared to the reality. Exactly. Well, that has been a, a great pleasure having you on the show. And what I like about you is that you're such a brilliant, deep man, but you're also very humble, I see. And you're also willing to learn and explore. And I think you want to really contribute to humanity, right? You want to leave behind some great, great things uh, to help others as well. And well, well, uh, thank you, Dr. Avila. Yeah, it's, uh, I, mean, we, I think that that's sort of the heart of the scientific attitude. It yes. is, I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm willing to learn. <laughs> <laughs> right, but you bring a compassion and humor into it as well. Like uh, some people are turned off by science that it's too, too difficult to understand, but you make it understandable. You bring it down to a real understandable mindset. Well, and also you. you give a little humor with it and kind of, uh, you know, things that we can uh, take with us. Uh, and I would love to have you on again as usual. You know, you're really a great um, emer- well, we have this emeritus professor at Love University. How about that? Very Maybe good. Thank you very much. I, I'd be happy to, to talk again. Out of the uh, and where can we hear more about you? Do you have a website? Do you have any publications and books and things that people can get a hold of um, uh, from you? Um, well, my book, uh, The Case Against Reality, um, is for a popular audience, so I tried to make it as successful as I, as I could. It has a lot of these ideas. Okay. Um, that's available just, through Amazon and all the, all the publishers and everything. That, that's right, from Amazon and, and yeah. Apple Books and so forth. Okay. Um, if you just Google Donald Hoffman, H-O-F-F-M-A-N, I've got a bunch of videos and podcasts, oh. dozens and dozens of them now that you can look up. And uh, yeah, I've got Chopra. I think you had one with him as well. Yeah, I've got a bunch with Chopra. Maybe like eight, eight or nine videos with uh, Deepak Chopra, um, and, and so forth. So, so there's lots of uh, if people are interested, a lot of videos. And if you're interested in the scientific work, um, you can email me at ddhoff, ddhoff at uci.edu, and and I can send links to um, my scientific for the you know like if there's a student who was thinking about uh, you know, really seriously going forward on this, then I'd be happy to send links to the papers. I, for that, I would just say, learn a ton of math, mm-hmm. computer science, information yes. theory, and cognitive neuroscience. Yes. You can't know enough of that. If you're going yes. to go into this area of, of, of getting a mathematical model of consciousness, you've yes. really got to have a, lo- a big grounding in all this stuff. So, well, so, so, Dr. Hoffman. so D.D. Hoff at UCI.edu. That's right. You're not at the university now? Is it because you're retired or is it for another reason? 
Um, I'm I'm emeritus at the university, so I'm I'm yes. still. In fact, I'm giving a talk to. Oh, she's still uh, there. The, okay. Well, I don't teach, but I'm giving like a, a talk to the campus-wide honors group in a, in a oh, couple. Okay. Of, and, and well, so, maybe right. You want to go over there and see Dr. Hoffman in person? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, yeah. He loves this kind of stuff, right? <laughs> oh, right. We have when the when, well, the, of course, the, all the meetings right now are virtual, right? But after the oh, pandemic, okay. yeah, absolutely. But I, I I retired early. Um, because I wanted time to think about consciousness. <laughs> I, 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 no, I, you I, three hours a day, right? You, you really you, can uh, enjoy it, right? <laughs> that, that's right. I, 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 I was at the university for 37 years, so that's wow. enough. Awesome. And now I would like to have some time to think more yeah, time think to think. about it, even more ideas. Yeah, that's wonderful. Right, exactly. So this is Dr. Avila. Uh, so if you have questions for Dr. Hoffman, you can email us at loveuniversitylove at gmail.com. Visit us at loveuniversity.love. Call us at 310-226-8090. Again, it's been a wonderful pleasure. So I think the, one of the bottom lines is infinite exploration. You know, don't just yes. take things for granted. Keep thinking, keep exploring about what life is about. And don't just say that this one fits all. You know, there's many possibilities in life. You know, there's different right. situational things that can occur. But I think the key is we want to adapt as a human race to be more loving, more giving, and more productive in life. You know, to leave something behind to the new right. generation. Uh, and extend loving energy without expectation. That, that's our biggest motto here at Love University. I would agree. Okay. It's been a pleasure, Dr. Hoffman. Thank and, you, Dr. Avila. Uh, until next time, Love University, Dr. Avila. That was a great interview with Dr. Donald Hoffman, UCI professor, cognitive scientist, a brilliant man who's won many awards in his fascinating work with conscious realism. Reality is not what it seems. So we learned a lot today. We learned that society is advancing in different ways. We need to learn how to be infinitely curious and keep expanding our knowledge and wisdom. And also to give love. And Dr. Hoffman did talk about artificial intelligence. But I still believe that the one element that separates us from machines is love. Unconditional love. Love without expectations. Agape. Karuna. Compassion or bhatki. Devotion in different philosophies and religions. But mainly the spiritualness is within you. Loving yourself, others, and a higher nature. It's something that I believe will always distinguish us from any other creature, any other machine, is this love that we have. And to be able to help other people create powerful goodness and success in our society. So until next time, this is Dr. Alex Avila. If you want to reach us, visit us at loveuniversity.love. Email us at loveuniversitylove at gmail.com. Call us at 310-226-8090. I also want to make an announcement. We're having our annual love types valentine's conference a zoom conference that's actually going to be free for everyone that listens to the show you can email me at loveuniversitylove at gmail.com for more details it will be on february 12th 7 p.m friday night it's a pre-valentine so you get a chance to discover your personality romantic style your love type and meet the right person based on your psychological love type so it's going to be a lot of fun we're going to be doing a, a talk a mixer people are going to get into their different uh, personality groups, and maybe meet the right person, the person of your life. So if you're interested, please email me at that uh, address, and we'll give you more details on how to get involved. If you want to subscribe to us, you can do so at Podbean, Spotify, SoundCloud, and iTunes. And you can also like us on Facebook at Love University Podcast. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Love Letter U Podcast. Until next time, this is Dr. Alex Avino, Love University. Put away your notebooks, your iPads, your phones, and pick up your mind for more knowledge and wisdom. Until next time, Dr. Avila. Love University students, I want to make an exciting announcement right now. We're going to have our first Zoom Love University presentation on February 12th, Friday, 7 o'clock Pacific time. It is called Find Your Compatible Valentine, Asking the Four Magic Questions, based on my best-selling book, Love Types, a Myers-Briggs personality types. you learn how to find a compatible soulmate or partner on this special evening with quality singles all throughout America. And what we'll do is we'll introduce the love type system, how it works, the different personality types based on introvert or extrovert, thinker or feeler. And then we'll break it down into groups. The four groups are the meaning seekers, excitement seekers, security seekers, and knowledge seekers. And each of them have specific characteristics and you can mingle and match with people that are similar to your personality type and possibly find the ideal love in your life. So it's going to be a free event for the first 100 to sign up through Eventbrite. So if you want to register, go to my website, loveuniversity.love. And there you have all the details, the links to how to get there, how to sign up for this powerful and amazing event we're going to have.